Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. I'm Stacy Herbert. I remember back in the day, a famous quote from Maggie Thatcher. Stacy, tell us more. Yes, she said there is no such thing as society, and the middle classes rejoiced as all of that public housing came onto the market, and they were on the property ladder. Today, they are actually very surprised that there is no such thing as society, and they're outraged, and they act as if there's no context to the unrest in the UK. So I want to take you to a headline from 2009 in The Economist magazine, Global Tinderbox. 2010 could be a year that sparks unrest. Yeah, yeah, this is, we covered this when it came out and The Economist magazine blatantly was handicapping social unrest, picking, trying to figure out what countries are most prone to it. And to, to your point, people are saying, where did this come from? Who could have seen it coming? It was, it was a whole feature story in The Economist. Tell the people, tell the people. And this is separate from their political unrest index. This is their social unrest index. And if you look at the map, you see that Britain had a medium risk of unrest, social unrest. If the world appears to have escaped relatively unscathed by social unrest in 2009, they wrote, despite suffering the worst recession since the 1930s, it might just prove the lull before the storm. And they cite not only the increasing poverty, but they say Poverty alone does not spark unrest. They also cite exaggerated income inequalities, poor governance, and lack of social provision. Right, so Thatcher, Reagan, they chop the economic supports out from underneath the vast majority of the population. There's a brief sugar high of real estate appreciation, which everyone interprets as their newfound riches, even though it's all based on debt and it all has now been washed out to sea and they're all being broke again, resulting ultimately in the very predictable social unrest in a city like London, as predicted and handicapped and talked about by The Economist magazine, which called it their social cohesion risk. And the results today, are being viewed as somehow isolated without context or historical precedent, or somehow nobody knew that they were coming, and that's completely false. Exactly, and now a lot of people are saying that you can't understand this in any way, it's just sheer mindless evil, because there have been no austerity measures implemented yet. And yet, today, Max, I was reading the uh, Financial Times, and Mervyn King, the Bank of England, said that inflation would reach as high as 5% this year. So this is ignorance on a wide scale that the populations don't understand inflation as an austerity measure. That's right. The austerity measures have come in the form of excessive bank fees. You know, when these people who are not part of Goldman Sachs inner circle and they take money out of the bank, they get raped by the banks with these fees. They're, it's financial austerity and uh, oppression when you're charged 29.9% or higher for your credit card rates. Again, Goldman Sachs employees get negative interest rates on their borrowed money. It's a Jim Crow laws as applied to interest rates. It's basically financial apartheid. And these people are living in a financial prison and this was a prison revolt. And now, Many commentators are noting that these rioters are just reflecting the looting that has happened from the banking class. Now, let's look at how the politicians who, remember, just reflect their population of voters' interest and what they demand. Look at how the difference of how they treat these people are. UK riots, young yobs back on streets despite David Cameron's pledge. So this is from The Telegraph, and they're demanding harsher sentencing than, than is being handed down to 11 and 12-year-olds. The photo you see in this article is a 12-year-old who stole a, basically a $10 bottle of wine. And he's been given a referral order, which means community service and rehabilitation. And this is not enough. They went prison for this 12-year-old for stealing a $10 bottle of wine. Well, look, David Cameron has to decide whether he's going to allow plundering in the city of London to finance his economic growth, George Osborne has to make this decision, or whether he's going to outlaw plundering in the city of London 
and therefore outlaw plundering in the rest of society. You can't have both, David Cameron. You can't allow plundering in the city of London and then outlaw it in the ghetto that you created from the city of London, plundering. So it was the phrase that you see on on online a lot. Uh, STFU, STFU, David Cameron, because you're completely off base here. You are a total product of an elitist school of banking schmucks. Well, Max, let's look at a quote from David Cameron about these young looters, the 11 and 12 year olds. He says, quote, if you're old enough to commit the crime, you are old enough to face the punishment. So I wanna wind back to earlier this year from January 2011 in this headline. Cameron warns against banker bashing. So UK Prime Minister David Cameron yesterday said he understood the public anger towards the nation's banks, but warned against banker bashing. Here it's blatantly obvious that your own bankers are financially raping your people. Right up there, Cameron, you did nothing because you're in their pocket, because you're a schmuck. Why are you going after these people? <laughs> um, now, let's continue on this theme of how the banking looters are treated differently from the looters who take $10 bottles of wine. Here's a little clip from the third week of July, 2008, in the heat of the beginning of the real market meltdown. There's no question about it. Wall Street got drunk. That's one reason I should turn off the TV cameras. He got drunk and now he's got a hangover. So, oops. Trillions evaporated. Trillions were handed to bankers based on their fraudulent activities, which destroyed the global economy. Oops, they got drunk. That's right. And they committed massive fraud. And uh, they're all being applauded as entrepreneurs. Meanwhile, these so-called looters in the ghettos of London, they should be going down to Goldman Sachs office and JP Morgan's office and getting in line to take jobs because they've demonstrated the ability to loot and plunder and steal. That makes them qualified to be investment bankers. They should all be given jobs. You know why they won't be given jobs? Because Lloyd Blankfein and Jamie Dimon don't want the competition. <laughs> you see, if they were actually pro-capitalism, they would set up ghetto investment bank and put these kids to work, raping and plundering the global economy. But that won't happen because HSBC, Barclays, and all those UK banks that were bailed out by the federal government, bailed out by the people, don't want the competition. So here you have the leader of the free world, George W. Bush at the time, apologizing and providing an excuse for the bankers. He's saying they were drunk. Now here's what happened to a, a looter in Brixton. Brixton looters jailed for six months. So Mabeka Bell, 23, took several iPod touches and iPod nano devices from a Curry's in Brixton. When interviewed by police, Bell said she had been drinking heavily and followed a group of boys into Curry's. She took the items from the floor of the store. Now she's been sentenced to six months in prison, but the population is baying for more. They want her put behind bars for longer. Drunkenness is not an excuse in this 23-year-old girl's case. No, it's not an excuse for some schmuck on the ground. No, yeah, and if you go to the city of London on a Friday night, you'll see investment bankers in suits and ties defecating. Do they get a ticket for that? No. Do they get reprimanded for that? No. They get applauded. Bravo, says David Cameron. Yay, says George Osborne. So back to that social unrest index. Um, the U.S. is very low on that list, but let's look at a few little headlines from the U.S. Nearly 15% of the U.S. population relied on food stamps in May, according to the United States Department of Agriculture. Now, in that clip with George Bush, he went on to uh, make a joke about how expensive property was in Texas. And it's followed right on him saying all the fraudulent activities of the bankers was excused by their drunkenness. So he's making a connection between all the banking activity and inflation that the middle class tends to love and the property prices. In the meantime, the bottom of the, the ladder, 15% of the U.S. population is on food stamps. That's right. And food stamps, of course, applied by J.P. Morgan. Yeah. Who are feeding both sides of this nightmare. They're kind of like the food company that sells junk food and diarrhea medicine.
They've got both ends covered. So did J.P. Morgan. They create the inflation with the food stamps, and then they create these fees selling collateralized bonds tied to the inflation-adjusted food stamps nightmare, and they're nothing but a parasite. I agree with Vladimir Putin, who says that the entire U.S. banking system is a parasite on the world. Bravo! I agree! So let's look on to another case of hypocrisy that happens on a global scale. High-frequency firms triple trades in route. The stock market's fastest electronic firms boosted trading threefold during the route that erased $2.2 trillion from U.S. equity values, stepping up strategies that profit from volatility. So over this past week, while all these markets have been in turmoil, 75% of American equity volume in August was due to high-frequency trading. I predicted this. I said that, of course, Moody's would downgrade U.S. debt because it would increase volatility. Yeah. They downgraded exactly as I predicted, and it, volatility increased substantially exactly as I predicted. This is the new profit center for Wall Street, churning and burning U.S. sovereign debt, sovereign debt around the world. This is their new profit center. Now, this is a very interesting quote from the article. Again, think of all of these, the swift justice that has happened in the UK against young people who have stolen items worth 10 bucks or so. U.S. prosecutors have joined a regulatory investigation into whether some high-speed traders are manipulating markets by posting and immediately canceling waves of rapid-fire orders. Justice Department investigators are working with the SEC to review practices that, quote, are potentially manipulative. That's right, it's looting. It's high-speed looting, high-frequency trading, high-frequency looting. Every day it goes on. The Alan Greenspans of the world, the Ben Bernanke's of the world, uh, the Barack Obamas of the world will say, well, that's how the economy works. We're adding liquidity to the system. We're making a market. But yet when somebody down at the ghetto steals an iPod, somehow that's morally ab abhorrent. It's the exact same thing. They're morally equivalent. So you have to decide, Cameron, what kind of society do you want? Do you want to, do you want to go down the Thatcher path and say there is no society? We're just going to kill each other for the uh, available... Uh, few bucks, a quid, or do we have some kind of republic or some kind of civilization? But you can't have both. You can't have just one set of rules for your friends and another set of rules for the people who aren't from the same school that you went to. No, because there's two sets of laws. There's two sets of rules. There's two sets of uh, moral paths that are being uh, managed at the same time. And one happens to be controlled by the folks that are doing the stealing, and this, not the ghetto kids, but George Osborne's buddies. They're, they're the mass, th those are the, 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 the vulgar plundering scum that needs to be brought to book, not the poor schmucks in the ghetto that are the victims of your crimes. You've got blood on your hands, George Osborne. Ooh, you're swimming in it. <laughs> well, that's important for the population. It's up to the population as well. The population, I have to say, is much more outraged by these young thugs in the, in the ghetto than they are by the, the older thugs in the city. They are clearly more outraged and they are demanding their politicians, the very same politicians, I might add, that only months ago were caught stealing tens of thousands of pounds for, from the taxpayer in fake expenses to buy computer equipment and widescreen televisions, just as these looters were doing. Well, most of the people who are criticizing the uh, uprising in the ghetto will be joining the uprising soon enough. <laughs> that's what the French Revolution would teach that, us. That, that's, what, that's what we know from history, yeah. Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Stay tuned. Much more coming your way, so don't go away. would be so much brighter if you knew more about someone from first impressions. Meet friends.rt.com Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to Kansas City, Missouri and talk with the man responsible for putting more than 1,000 bankers behind bars in the 1980s. 
Professor William K. Black. Bill Black, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thank you. All right, Professor Black, markets around the world are once again in chaos as bank shares around the world tumble. Would things have been different had Eric Holder pursued banking criminals in 2009? Bill Black. Yes, but things would have been far better if uh, his predecessor, Mukasey, had pursued them. Uh, it's a question of you could have prevented the entire crisis. Uh, obviously, what happened in the Obama administration is they decided to declare victory and go home. And so uh, Secretary Geithner has been going around saying that he solved the entire financial crisis uh, for less than it cost to deal with the savings and loan debacle. And of course, this is complete nonsense and the chickens have come home to roost and they're being slaughtered as we watch. Yeah, it seems like uh, the basis for not pursuing the criminals on Wall Street is to make the case that, well, talk about chickens, uh, that old joke of Woody Allen, where he goes to the doctor and says, doctor, my brother thinks he's a chicken. The doctor says, take these pills. And the brother says, wait, you don't understand. We need the eggs. In other words, the joke being that the criminality is what's needed to keep the f system functioning. The U.S. has become a kleptocracy. It thrives on the criminality. It thrives on the fraud. Is that too much or is that correct, Bill Black? It doesn't thrive. It's uh, the, the most destructive thing. Uh, but what thrives is the CEOs. And this is what uh, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, George Akerlof, and his co-author Paul Romer wrote about in 1993. And their title pretty much says it all, looting the economic underworld of bankruptcy for profit. And what they said, and I'm quoting them, is that this kind of fraud by the CEOs using accounting is a sure thing. So it's a sure thing that the CEOs will get rich. The way they get rich, unfortunately, is by deliberately making bad loans, which create a lot of phony accounting income. So it's also guaranteed that they will ruin the economy. And then the question is, are the prosecutors going to take them on? And we've had two administrations in a row, the Bush and the Obama administration, that have allowed these criminals to operate with near total impunity. All right, Bill Black, you mentioned the word looting. And anyone who looks at this situation, even for five minutes, can tell that this is a case of looting. And why is it that Obama can't, does he need to look up the word looting in the dictionary? Or is it, what's his problem? Well, again, it's not unique to Obama. This is the last two administrations, and indeed under the Clinton administration as well, especially near the end, where they passed Commodities Future Modernization Act to stop all regulation of credit default swaps. These have been uh, three administrations that have adopted policies that in our jargon and criminology are highly criminogenic. That means they will produce epic amounts of fraud. And then you had Attorney General McCasey under Bush famously refuse to even investigate the major frauds, saying that they were simply the equivalent of, and again I'm quoting, white collar street crime. And then it's revealed in the New York Times that Secretary Geithner intervened to try to prevent even investigations, much less prosecutions, of the largest banks. And so we have this bizarre incredible concept from Treasury Secretary Geithner, and that is the path to financial stability is to leave the frauds who caused this crisis in control of our largest banks and then to bail them out and then to seek political contributions from them. All right, let's talk about the rating agencies for a second, because uh, during the period when the collateralized debt obligations were created, the securitization, the derivatives explosion, during the 2000s, the, the rating agencies gave AAA ratings to what could be ostensibly referred to as crap. And uh, now, suddenly, the rating agencies are turning uh, seemingly on the very banks that they were in bed with just a couple of months ago. Was, has there been a shift in, in the, uh, in other words, uh, in organized crime, many times it'll have interseen in warfare between the Gambinos and the, some other f crime family. Is the criminal, criminality at the rating agencies, have they gone to war with the funds and the U.S. government? Is there an inter-gang war going on? 
oh, there's a great publicity scam going on. What is everybody in the world talking about? Standard and Poor's, right? This is the greatest creation of free publicity uh, in modern financial history. So uh, the stuff that they gave the AAA ratings to was actually referred to in the trade at the time before it blew up as toxic waste. And indeed, it had been referred to that in that to uh, phrase for over a decade. The FBI warned in 2004 that there was an epidemic of mortgage fraud, using their words, and predicted that it would cause a financial crisis if it were not stemmed. And nobody thinks it was stemmed. The Mortgage Bankers Association, which is the trade association of the perps, had an anti-fraud unit called MARI, which reported to the entire industry in 2006 the following three things. First, that stated income loans, also called Alt-A, were, and I'm quoting, an open invitation to fraudsters. Second, that the incidence of fraud in these loans was 90%. And third, that therefore these loans deserve the phrase that the banking community used behind closed doors, which was liar's loans. Now add two more facts to this. First, we know both from logic and investigations that it was overwhelmingly the lenders that put the lies in liar's loans. And second, by 2006, Roughly 30% of all new mortgage originations in the United States were liars' loans. It's really important to understand something that very few economists understand. They treat as dichotomous. In other words, there are two categories that don't overlap. Liars' loans and subprime. That is not true. Subprime loans, by 2006, roughly half of all subprime loans were liars' loans. And that's where, where we get that overall figure of about 30% of total mortgage originations in 2006 were liars' loans. Remember, 90% fraudulent. That means more, well over a million fraudulent loans a year. And after the FBI warning and after the MARI warning, the industry dramatically increased the percentage of liar's loans that it made. That means that when Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch were giving triple A ratings on the collateralized debt obligations, that the CDOs were primarily backed by fraudulent mortgages. Something they that S&P, Fitch, and Moody's were all warned about. And so they all deliberately adopted a, the financial version of don't ask, don't tell. And there's an infamous S&P memo from 2000 or 2001 in which the poor professional rater asks for the loan files so we can actually review the credit quality of a sample of the loans. So what happens? He gets back a flame gram from his boss in all uh, capitals, triple exclamation point, saying that it is totally outrageous to ask to see the loan files that the people, the Merrill Lynch's of the world, the Lehman Brothers, putting these CDOs together, don't even have the loan files, never looked at the loan quality. Finally, Bill Block, can you compare the looting going on in the UK with the looting by the bankers? Yes. When your most elite, most powerful members of society adopt a strategy of what Bastiat, the famous French economist, very conservative, called plundering. Then, as he said, they will develop a morality that doesn't simply permit plundering, but valorizes it. And when that happens, the moral structures of the society will inevitably deteriorate. In the upper classes, that leads to polite looting. In the underclasses, it leads to street looting. So, okay, well, let's follow up on this. In other words, so 
We've got the uh, looting going on in both sex strata of society. Now, the public has demanded something like 16,000 police to go into the streets to stop this street looting. Where were they in demanding similar actions to stop the bank looting? It hasn't happened, and the Obama administration has followed the Bush policies of doing everything possible to prevent the public from targeting what it should be targeted, the elite looters. Obama's famous statement to the big bankers in person was, I'm the only thing standing between you and the pitchforks. Now, of course, he's not supposed to stand between the elite criminals and the justice system. And none of us want pitchforks, or at least not many of us want pitchforks. We want good old-fashioned prosecutions followed by jail time, just as what happened in the savings and loan crisis where the Justice Department worked with the regulators and achieved more than a thousand felony convictions and more than 90 percent conviction rate. And those are only the in cases designated as major by the Justice Department. Almost all of those people were prosecuted. Typically, they were prosecuted successfully. So this was the greatest success against elite white collar criminals in history, and we can emulate it any time. And you are absolutely right in your question. If the people will wake up and demand this, demand as I have that Holder resign, that he be replaced by a real prosecutor, and this be made a priority, then it will happen. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Bill Black, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Bill Black. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.